Hello everybody, welcome back to the Inner Circle Boardroom's Backstage Pass. This is a channel for busy professionals on the go. If you're interested in business, finance and leadership, then please subscribe. My objective with this channel is to create content that informs and educates. We'll bring you special guests like the one I have here today. So if you enjoy this content, please don't forget to subscribe. Our special guest is Mark Taylor. Mark is a leading expert on global supply chain. He's a keynote speaker and multi award winning published author. Mark, thanks for being with us here today. For the sake of our audience, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and the type of work that you're involved in? So I'll give you the Reader's Digest version as I'm conscious we're on the clock. Around my background uh, post-education was in the armed forces, so uh, UK armed forces. And it was there after a, um, a spell there, I moved out into the wider Ministry of Defence and then on to uh, public sector consulting. So uh, working with people like AT, Kearney, um, KPMG, McLaren Alliance. And after a short while, um, it has always been uh, an intent of mine. I had an epiphany while working in logistics in the military. That I set up a Taylor Consulting Group, which was primarily logistics and supply chain, looking at transformation, AI and automation. And a little bit later on, we acquired VTR Consulting, which is a purely a pure transformation arm. And that focuses on uh, digital transformation. So that's what the group's made up of. One is pure transformation, digital, and one focuses pretty much on our core product, which is supply chain. And we now operate in between uh, governments setting up new supply chains in uh, South America, Middle East, and on places like that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So the conversation today is going to be around global supply chain and the disruption. Mark, tell us, what have you, um, what have you learnt about the impact within different sectors and what sort of conversation and trends are you seeing right now? Well, in supply chain, we've been risk analysing supply chain now, even at an academic level where it's taught at universities such as Plymouth, do a very good uh, uh, supply chain management uh, degree. So we're looking at risks and long before COVID, we had Brexit, which is a real Achilles heel in supply chain. Most people are smart enough to realize that when they press their button on Amazon, if we don't have trade agreements, it's, if it's not coming from inside our own shores, i.e. made here, it, there's going to be an impact on supply chain with that. And prior to COVID, with people stockpiling dry spaghetti and toilet rolls, mm-hmm. we had what we term as the, the key strategic uh, risks that we foresaw with supply chain. And these may materialize and may not. But most people are aware of the South China Sea, what's going on in there with uh, China with its uh, effectively a, a ocean uh, population, ocean land grab and building there. You've got the Indian uh, subcontinent around Sri Lanka, which built a huge logistic network there, which was the Chinese, again, Asian footprint in that ocean. The Port of Aden, uh, hugely influential to us in supply chain and shipping. Um, during the, well, due to the nature of the country that it's situated in, that may become unusable, which again will cause us huge, huge issues. You had the Hanjin collapse, which was completely unforeseen. Uh, you know, a global uh, logistic uh, provider uh, maritime. And if we stack the containers that are currently in the ocean at the time of the collapse, you know, we could just about reach the moon, I think the stats say. And finally, um, the uh, North Sea Corridor, the North uh, Atlantic Corridor, uh, coming across when the polar ice melts across the uh, northern part of Russia there. But of course, um, the sovereign country, there, Vladimir wouldn't want his chunk of change for you using that route. It is much, much quicker, but it does have its own integral risks. And this comes down to where we as a nation uh, procure what we procure and where the hard and fast minerals come from that we, we get those. Example, uh, America, they want to go quite secular with their insourcing, yet their country produces very little, if any, aluminium. It all comes from elsewhere, namely uh, Canada and a few others. So it, the raw materials need to be brought in. So supply chain either brings in the product or brings in the raw materials for the country to make the product. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point you've just touched on there. We know that the uh, countries like the US and even the UK are some of the largest importers. I think uh, it's roughly about 80% of all pharmaceutical and manufacturing goods are produced out of China. Um, During a pandemic, 
what sort of tensions and supply chain issues does that actually cause? Well, you've got several in a, in a pandemic because while, when the ships are under sail, um, they're okay because the crew are effectively in quarantine for the length of time on that ship. The only point will be if there was a mass outbreak, which the UK is looking at a second spike now, you know, 50 cases per week, some horrific tabloid uh, produced there mid-October. You lose what the, sh the ships in the supply chain getting from point of embarkation to departure. Um, the ships need a huge amount of resource to actually turn those ships around, get the resource off and get to going where, where it actually is going. So in with COVID, you've got the Brexit piece. You know, we could have 7,000 lorries parked on the uh, M27 somewhere, if that's to be believed. Um, so it's the effect on the actual point of origin and the point of uh, embarkation that is going to affect supply chain most. Like I say, when, it's under, when you're under sail, um, most ships now quite easily, they go into quarantine a, a week or two before they sail. So if they have any issues, they can, they can deal with it on the ship. So they're, they're under steam. It's just purely, if you can't get it off the ports, there's only so much room where you can park these container ships. They are pretty big, and the UK is not really a big uh, island to park mm. these up in the channel. So <laughs> the, our options are there's not a motorway out there where we can park all these ships and leave those people on there forever. And let's think of uh, an example. You know, um, the film 28 Days Later. If your yep. port had, you know, three or four workers that were not suffering, they're not self-isolating, you effectively lose that, uh, you lose that facility. And there is no real automation on that side of life. It is still human beings that do that uh, work. Obviously, that's a bottleneck for businesses. Um, how should businesses start thinking about their supply chain? To be honest, it depends what sector the business is in. The um, supply chain, if you're retail, you're going to be thinking about supply chain for Christmas, you know, right, right at the start of your second quarter, aren't you? You're going to be trying to look ahead with your crystal ball of what you need to start procuring and bring into the country then because you, you know there's going to be a bottleneck around pinch point times. Um, it's also going to focus very heavily, not on your sector, but what actually you want. How, how easy is that to procure? How easy is that to source? And one thing you look at in supply chain is you're not looking at single source providers. Uh, I use Volkswagen, I believe it was, as the example. They had a uh, contractual or commercial disagreement with the company that made their seat buckles. The seat buckles went across the range of cars. Supply stopped and it effectively stopped Vauxhall making cars because they didn't have a seat buckle. So it's a, that's a key identifier there of single point of failure. You've got one supplier who delivers a critical piece. If that one supplier falls over for whatever reason, be it pandemic or anything else, you cannot produce your product. So you could have your airframe, your engine, everything there, but you've lost it on a simple piece of plastic, which is there to save people's lives. It's integral and you can go no further. And it's not the sort of thing you can flick a switch and go to the next supplier and say, can I have some seat belt, seat belt buckles for my Vauxhall car? Or Volks, uh, Volkswagen car, I should say. At this time, I mean, we know that um, China has been very strategic in its approach and talking about merging markets and um, supply chain, short term and long term thinking China is versus somewhere like the US and the UK. China has a, a lot of patents on um, uh, chips, so to speak, which effectively are being used by um, other organisations. Um, will we see a contraction in terms of supply chain? Um, and will we see um, inflation because of the cost of that going up as well? And will that impact the consumer? There's a key part of the jigsaw there which uh, needs to come into play when we talk about cost of the consumer and supply chain costs rising. Um, you use China as your example. Um, there are many uh, usually uh, focusing in around the Indian subcontinent, of course. And one thing, particularly in the retail sector, that consumers are focusing on now, which is the elephant in the room, is ethics. People, consumers are incredibly concerned, and rightly so, about the ethical practices of the, not, not only the, uh, the companies that are procuring these items from uh, countries that may, may have different working practices, 
which we deem you know below uh, human standards it's the supply chains that bring those in are they adhering to the same ethical standards and we're not just talking about the environmental standards here the environment the carbon impact of supply chains we're looking at the ethics of how how people are living how people are getting paid across the world and by your supply chain taking the increase in the demand in that country are you exacerbating the problem within that country by enforcing almost a, a rudimentary cycle of cheap labor which uh, they, they live in you know, terrible conditions and get paid you know, an absolute pittance for what they do. So that's one key factor where we look at what will increase the cost of the supply chain, which will have a tangible effect. And ethics is huge. If you look at Boohoo, for example, which was a storm of all their own making, um, down to you know really poor PR of people that didn't really understand what the consumer was saying. It was highlighted to them by numerous uh, channels that... Uh, their, their clothing was being made in substandard, uh, let's say, a sub substandard way. Um, took no steps. The supply chain usually would, you know, retreat at that point, and we'd be looking at supplier two, three, or four when we uh, look at managing the risk over that because it's just not acceptable. And you can lose your name really quickly in retail with that sort of thing. Other things that are going to push it up, you mentioned the production of chips. It's going to be down to the countries that have one the skilled expertise in there that have the volumes of that expertise to produce the uh, material which is being designed or sought after. And two, it's the ability of that country to attain the raw minerals, um, chips, things like that. There's a lot of precious metals in there and rare earth minerals, which aren't easy to come across. There's only a few countries that produce them. It's their relationship with that. If that relationship uh, worsens or closes down, Will that then affect their ability to produce the uh, material and then your supply chain will literally have nothing to supply so uh, the whole reason we call it a supply chain is it needs to be flexible so we bend the chain and point it elsewhere so there's a lot of geopolitics um going on at the moment obviously we've got brexit we've got the us uh, elections uh, let's start with brexit what are some of the impact and implications that you see from a supply chain perspective that is going to affect not only the consumer but organizations who are importing and exporting goods well, let's just focus on one of the myriad of things that uh, are going to be an issue there um customs you you bring in anything in from a country to a country across in two sovereign states across a border be it hard soft or otherwise you're going to either need a a customs agreement or b a hard border where things are checked they're currently in the world legally they're the only two ways we can get around it you have the agreement or you have the border border hard border checks if you've got the agreement that's fine uh we, we can move it may put some time on you may um it may start to bottleneck while in process, while that's implemented in process, things like that. But it's not something that we'd look to impact long term. If it was a um, hard border, so between Ireland and ourselves, um, that's going to be much more, much more difficult and much more constrictive. One, it's going to be very, very labour intensive to do that. Uh, so the weight, the, the whole logistics of um, processing packages coming into the country, material resource in that manner, it doesn't bear thinking about it. It's going to take a huge amount of resource, huge amount of time. For the companies that are wanting to export import, there's been numerous uh, missives put out by companies' house. Mm -hmm. You need this license, that license, fill in this form, this e form. So the actual legalities behind it are relatively swept up. It takes a bit of resource to you know, complete everything, but you can get your uh, license numbers, things like that. The hard thing is, is actually is doing, it in, doing it in person. If you've got somebody ordering your product from UK and the 7,000 trucks, which I think it was muted in the press this morning, the 7,000 trucks on the uh, M27 and your number 6,999, your customer isn't going to get that product in the timely manner that they expect it. And... If we look at the big, the big boys on the market, like Amazon, uh, people press prime delivery and will expect to see that in a, a reasonably short period of time, quite often next day. Um, now, if you're selecting something and it says this from UK and you think that's going to come with a a tax, a customs charge, I'm going to have to go to my local post office to pick it up because they're not going to deliver it to my letterbox because I've got to pay that charge. And B, it's going to take me six weeks to get my, um, you know, Harry Potter book or whatever it is. It's going to take me six weeks. 
and the customs charge is actually and the import charge and the tax is more than the product was worth. So you've got a whole myriad of issues where people will just see that union flag and go, ah, is, it, is there somewhere else that I can order this from? Um, coming into the UK, it's going to be very, very similar where the suppliers are looking at, do I want my you know, 130,000 displaced tonnes of ship sat in that port for three weeks while they get around to unloading it? Or do I want to park it up in Germany, where it, so Hamburg, for example, where it can be done in hours? Yeah. And they may go, well, actually, we're better going there, um, putting it on the supply chain through, through the land routes. So sev several ways that it's going to impact. But I think it will come down to consumers. Will, will the consumer, in order to stay low, go, I'm willing to take the hurt, take the risk, uh, take the risk, take the uh, hurt and pain and wait a protracted period of time to get my item? Or do I want it tomorrow? Click. Yeah. So I'm going to be slightly controversial in that, um, you know, once upon a time, we never used to be a part of the union and, uh, you know, we used to import and export goods. Won't it be as simple as what it used to be? I mean, other than the thing that's changed as time um, and relationships. Um, the other thing is, as we know, that being a part of the European Union, there was a lot of restrictions around goods and the way they were made, the way they were imported. Um, do we think that would mean that we're going to start seeing more counterfeit goods coming into the UK or um, the quality being substandard, you know, how that's going to affect the consumer other than from a time perspective? Hmm. Okay, so if I answer the first half of the question first, uh, the, the pre-EU uh, pre days, now I was around in the 70s and I can tell you for an utter fact it wasn't a nice place to be. It wasn't great. Um, yes, we had uh, a reasonably free market. We still had trade agreements between certain nations and ourselves as we'd always had post Second World War. Um, but it wasn't great. If you think about that, uh, there were no mobile phones, no internet, nothing like that. You wanted something, you licked a stamp, put it on an envelope and sent it off. You know, it was literally Catalog. old <laughs> old school as you get. Um, would it go back to that? Yes, of course it will. It's how long we get from where we currently are to that uh, free market economy where we can just sit in an island and do our own thing, uh, if that will ever be the case. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in the intricacies of Brexit and the, the pros and cons for it, supply chain wise. The, the decisions made, we then have to deal with that. And that's why uh, we're paid what we are for what we do. We go, the decisions made, we don't get to say in that decision, but we have to deal with the so what from that. And then we're looking at, you mentioned their uh, counterfeit goods. Again, not really an issue for supply chain because that's down to the way the consumer procures via the company. So most companies now, most large uh, retail companies will have a, uh, certain flags, uh, markers that they put on certain things, certain countries, they'll do so many sweeps of counterfeit and artificial goods. As long as there's a market for them, counterfeit goods will exist. Will I see that get it, get it flooding in the, in, into the UK, you know, black market? Ah, doubtful, no more than it already exists already, I would suggest. Um, for the vast bulk of supply chain, we've got no interest in moving less than legal uh, merchandise anyway. We've got, it, it, there's no benefit to us whatsoever. It harms the clients and the customers at both ends. So supply chain, we will do everything we could to steer away from that um, wherever possible. And of course, you're looking at the ethics. If some com consumers work out that you're getting it through nefarious means, or it's not 100% kosher, somebody orders their Apple earpods and they are not made by Apple, you know, the storm, particularly in the UK, will be uh, huge and the supply chain will be affected as well as the customer. So what are some of the gaps and opportunities that you see that exist at the moment based on the conversations that you're having? Well, there are always opportunities. You can make opportunities uh, out of every sort of crisis. It is not ever all black. Um, so the, the, the naysayers and the doom and gloom about Brexit, there are opportunities. We've focused that. We've looked at the Japan trade agreement. There are agreements that can be made. Stepping away from the WTO side of life, because they take quite a long time to set up. So more cottage industry-like, you know, how can we circumnavigate the system? And there'll be certain, what we'd look at is certain caps. 
So if your industry earns uh, gross net less than that, say seven and a half million um, pounds per annum, you, you get certain concessionary uh, uh, customs agreements, things like that. So we as a as a nation can put certain things in there to incentivize uh, the small medium enterprises, as the, the chancellor refers to them. Large companies, I think they will probably, you know, your Amazons will weather the storm. But where they've seen the opportunity, we've known it in supply chain for years. Amazon have been building their own supply chain. Mm. Their own planes, their own ships, their own couriers. So there's a there's a huge threat there. If you're in if you're a third party logistics provider and Amazon are your main customer, uh, your main customer's about your main customer is about to become your main competitor if they get move into that business. So that's something that at that end of the supply chain, you need to be very, very mindful of. If you look at your books, 80% of your revenue is coming from somebody who's about to do exactly what you do themselves. You're going to need to diversify or, or move away into a different channel or stream. So looking at um, COVID, Brexit, things like that, supply chain isn't really overly affected in the amount when we uh, talk about metric tonnage, things like that. Because where people start stop buying one thing, uh, all of a sudden it'll be PPE and your supply chain will have to ramp up fast where your PPE or the materials, the raw source materials for the PPE is manufactured, right? There's a load there. Where can we go to get that and keep it on a regular basis and supply? Does it need some sort of QA, some sort of quality assurance before it comes in? Of course it does if it's PPE. So we can't just go buying it from anywhere with no QE. Uh, there's documented pieces in the press where, 50 odd metric tons of something comes in, you know, face masks and they don't, don't work as they should. So it can't be done by clicking your fingers, but there are opportunities in supply chain to um, help the general population get through a pandemic like COVID, but also be able to provide the service. You're just moving different material from different point A to different point B. What's the typical cost of moving production? Depends on the country, but let's say we moved uh, production from... India have gone very large in their military procurement into uh, buy Indian, buy and make Indian, or just make Indian. They've done that very, very effectively. Now, um, if we look at their defence procurement in supply chain alone, uh, Apache helicopters, everybody knows what they are, big yeah. black hawking things uh, flying around. Now, they're clearly made by Boeing, United States. So what they've done, they've effectively gone into the helicopter supermarket, bought off the shelf, and under license, they're now making substantial parts of those actually in India. So even though it's bought off a shelf out of another country, you're getting the bare bones from there. You may get certain, uh, well, you're going to get a certain amount of support with that. You're bringing the component parts into India and then you're making it there. So you're, you're building jobs and you're building skill set and infrastructure all around that. So that's one very good example there of how you can do it in a country which doesn't have that natural, let's say, expertise or resource. There aren't many countries out there that make, you know, attack helicopters and the bits that bolt onto them. So you buy off a shelf and then say, well, how can we make this in our own country using our own uh, skill set and resource? So that's always one good uh, example to use uh, as to uh, how you can get around that. So you, you went on to India and thank you very much. You beat me to it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the next superpower. What are you seeing in terms of supply chain of those that were partnering with China previously? Are you seeing they go into countries like China, uh, sorry, India, Vietnam, Mexico? Um, have you got any foresight into that? Well, yeah, I don't need foresight now. If you're talking India, you've just got to Google Sri Lanka. Yeah. And literally half of... Uh, half of that island is a logistical port and it's their, it's their footprint, logistic footprint in that part of the ocean. Uh, they've done it very well, uh, very economically. Um, they've used uh, local labour yet uh, their own in-house resource in uh, China to actually build that port and get it up and running and working. But that's almost like lily pads where a frog would jump from one to the other. It's same in logistics. So that's going to be their hub in that part of the world. So, of course, India are going to profit massively from this because you, you've just got a huge log logistical hub that's been built right on your doorstep, right at the tip there. For uh, most supply chain, you're always going to look at the geopolitical situation within a uh, country. And also, you're going to look at the resource. Can it? How can this be done? Your quality margin, your quality line. 
and the infrastructure. It's not just about a country producing a great product, um, that you're not going to move a, a supply chain for that. But they may well be country two, three or four in your risk assessment of a product. Uh, so you may go, well, what we take is 60% uh, 60 of the units from our chosen supplier, but let's have a look and see how we can ramp up. So another 20,000 followed by a 10 and a 10 from suppliers three, four and five. So you can just move along there and see, you can just test your supply chain. Can they meet the demand? When we get it in, does it pass all of our quality assurance? Um, are they able to operate efficiently within supply chain? So you're talking mainly land and sea because air is still um, the very expensive option. Yet for some, it's the safest, fastest, most secure. So for, um, let's say India, for Boeing, for example, I doubt very much Boeing are going to put their very sensitive and very specialised avionics in a shipping container full of salt water and et, et cetera, out in the sea film, you know, 12 weeks. You know, that's going to be a different cargo. It's going to be moving in a different way. But again, you're going to look at uh, the infrastructure within that country. It's location, the infrastructure's location to where your, where your production is and also the infrastructure at that hub want to be able to deal with it. Is it secure? Can it be dealt with security? Is there a high instance of you know, theft? Do they have the right equipment? There's a whole myriad of things that you would look at um, when moving into a country. But I think a lot of logistics is going to be moving around there. It's certainly under the magnifying glass at the moment because uh, with what goes on in the South China Sea, Aiden, we, we need plan B and plan C in case um, anything gets upset there. It only takes um, a minor military faux pas in the South China Sea between two nations um, to make that unviable to put a commercial ship into. So um, we need them and they need to be workable. And to make them workable, we need to be able to test them. Mm. Um, that's going to take money. It's going to take expenditure. Um, and the very last thing you'd look at within that sort of bubble is... Um, something you probably talk about later, which is automation and talk about automated shipping. So uh, we, we've got our eyes currently on where that's going. Um, there's certain uh, research establishments which are sending unmanned vessels around the globe, which are piloting, navigating themselves, things like that. And already a lot of the ships are move, particularly large container ships, move effectively by remote control. It's uh, their geospatial awareness controlled by satellite and they're piloted in and out of ports by a human being. So um, we're already looking at, at that because that will increase our ability to meet um, future demand, demand in the supply chain. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, ships are built for human beings, uh, not cargo. They're built for humans, for humans to be able to walk around, uh, to be able to do the job and actually move the ships from A to B. Um, when you take the humans out of the concept or just have a small part, say a bridge where you, you know, you'd helicopter somebody in and they'd land and go and pilot in for the last miles into port to park it up. Um, the one thing we look at is the big shipping lines, you know, what was Hanjin, you've got Maersk. Now, we know market research tells us that these large companies are financially, you know, not in a great position. So they're not going to have the money to spend on research and development for um, the autonomous shipping. So they're probably going to buy off the shelf. So where we're looking there is to say, right, who's looking at this? You know, is it Plymouth University in the UK that have that Mayflower ship that's going to set sail on its own with nobody on board and it's going to park up in the USA out of the first Mayflower? You know, we'd be looking at that because not only is your supply chain then con con uh, transporting your containers and all of your material and resource, we look at that from a marketing perspective. What else can we build, bolt to this boat? Um, are the scientists out there that want certain bits and pieces that are collecting all their data and beaming it back uh, to wherever their headquarters is? Is there something else? Is there some uh, research institution that we can that will pay money again to uh, gather some data or some evidence or something like that? With it becomes huge risk. Anything that's automated can, whether well, it runs on basically a computer code, is susceptible to uh, crime. It's susceptible to uh, cyber criminals, things like that. So it needs to be um very very stringently policed and you 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 need your um what the military called you know the what if it goes wrong option you need to be able to have the switch that turns the thing off you know if if the worst does happen so all those sorts of options um need evaluating before you look at it 
but the the shape size and future of shipping there's already an autonomous port in hamburg which uh, the germans have been trialing and the only reason it isn't in mass production is because it's slower than human beings that's the only reason that we can see that it's not being rolled out but it's already automated now as soon as that becomes a more logical process um your automation uh, it's right for the picking and uh, you'd only benefit supply chain that's an interesting concept obviously we're seeing automated cars so um ships is no doubt we'll see that as well um let me just talk to you a little bit about uh future trends um and you spoke about automation there but um coming into 2021 uh what changes do you anticipate that we'll see in terms of supply chain well if we take um covid and brexit out, out of the equation or what, what changes you know will be could we foresee um ai is going to be one in supply chain and um augmented reality from the communist uh, the uh consumer standpoint uh augmented reality was something we were quite late to catch on in supply chain uh you know you log on look at a few sites and already that data's being gathered it's being harvested it's being looked at and they're starting to tailor things uh, it's been done in films you walk past a billboard and it recognizes you picks you up facial recognition lets the police know if you're uh, a bad person and sends them out to arrest you or tailors an advert on the next uh, billboard to what it is and that does have an effect on uh, people's buying trends buying habits in the retail sector so we would look at where we'd focus that we want insight into what is being targeted so with everything in supply chain particularly retail we look to pinpoint where those key pinch points are going to be if you start mass marketing something like um recent example the buzz lightyear toy remember that the old toy story buzz lightyear yeah pixar put it out knew it would be you know a good film but didn't realize it would have the traction it did and all of a sudden everybody everybody's uh, you know child's parent wanted one of these toys and they ran out real quick demand starts out outstripping supply and all of a sudden the the price starts ramping up because yeah. we're having to catch up with manufacture what we'd look at with uh, our crystal, our best crystal balls in our hands is forward looking to retail and say, right, what are you going to be pushing around these pinch points? We already do it for, you know, Christmases, things like that. We know what the big sellers are going to be. So we know roughly what parts of the world they come from, uh, whether it be made well of manufacturing. And we can also see p- pinch points in getting that into the UK and where we can store it and market it or whether it needs any special type of storage. So, uh, and also anything, any supplementary items that it runs on. Any parent that's been around Christmas know you need a good stock of uh, batteries, don't you? So it's the supplementary items that, that run with it, the, uh, the batteries and everything that goes with it. So from the augmented reality, we, what we want is some sort of precursor to say, ah, oh, they're now pushing this. We're now looking, it's coming into the summer season, or it's January, everyone's starting to get fit. So we're pushing, Nike are pushing this brand and blah, 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 and they're, They've got a pretty good supply chain as it is, to be fair. It's a bad example. But they would look at ramping that up then to meet that demand over Christmas because everyone wants to get fit in the new year. Let's talk about manufacturing and uh, the production of goods. Do we think that we're likely to see manufacturing come more close to home? We know what the US aspirations are. Yeah. But just based on raw minerals, you may not be bringing in the product, but you're going to need to bring in the raw minerals that make that product. Um, so your supply chain will still be exactly the same. You're just bringing in a different, different item. So UK wise, uh, you know, I'd really like to say yes, but UK, we don't, we don't really make steel, do we? So when, when we look at manufacturing, we're looking at your big, uh, sectors, your automotive, your aerospace, we've already seen a contraction of those, you know, with your Airbus wings and, uh, car manufacture. Mm manufacturing is all down to whether or not it's a viable concern to that company at that time if all of a sudden it's it becomes cost prohibitive to run the factory in the uk and to make that car they're not selling for whatever reason if it doesn't become viable then no business can carry on loss making just to keep a factory in the country you wouldn't do it you wouldn't do it in any other business um so it's looking at the long-term viability of those. If we look back into car manufacture, heavily subsidized with trade deals, things like that, back in the 80s, back in Thatcher's time, that bought all that automotive trade in, uh, which we've profited from uh, since, um, 
in the same vein with everything that's going on, we need to make it attractive for manufacture, uh, particularly in supply chain. The supply chain costs aren't the breaker for any manufacturer. Any manufacturer will tell you that. There's a cost to bringing it in, but the cost mainly is the procurement of the item, not the cost that the supply chain comp needs to bring it in. We will always trim the fat in supply chain. If there's a better way, a quicker way, a cheaper way, a more efficient way to get it from A to B, we'll find it. It's like a, you know, water running down the wall. The path of least resistance is the one supply chain will almost always take unless there's a uh, geopolitical or security situation involving that means we can't travel in our usual way. Um, with manufacturing the UK, uh, it falls back down to getting your product in and then getting it out GDP wise. You know, if we look at what we export GDP wise, what are our big sellers? Um, you know, if that starts to contract, your GDP shrinks and manufacturing by rationale will uh, start to contract as well. And do you think governments should be doing more than they already are in order to help businesses, particularly manufacturing? I'm not sure government is the right one. There's always more that can be done for businesses. Any business owner will tell you that. But um, governments get money from really one thing, don't they? Tax. Mm. Uh, be it uh, personal, VAT, or any other any other type of tax they put on, and that's how they spend the coffers. There's only so much a government can do without the necessary legal documents in place. Um, if one country, you know, digs its heels in when it comes to trade agreement and free trade and things like that, or if one country said, "If you go with those guys, we won't do you a deal here," you know. You're going to have to pick the less of two evils there. You're going to have to pick the best one, but you're literally cutting off one option of trade because they'll go elsewhere. Uh, so government's been able to do more. I'd say, yes, possibly. Looking at the demographics in the UK, you'd probably look at what businesses. You can't do everything for every business. So uh, I'd probably want to look at, what businesses with our limited pot of money can we help and will we get the main, I hate to use the words, you know, ROI, but what are we going to, what will the country benefit most from? If we spend money, you know, helping out the automotive, will that create, you know, thousands more jobs? Will it make areas back to being more wealthy? People have more money to spend better style of life. Um, if you bring aviation in, will that do something? But for that, you're going to have to give some sort of concessionary deal mm. to um, get those people in. If you look at the banking sector in Canary Wharf, you know, after Brexit, thousand by thousand, it's starting to become a ghost town. Mm. And straight away, you can see the countries that were positioning themselves, France in particular, move to Paris. We won't charge you any tax for five years, that sort of thing. Mm. You're going to have to make it attractive for businesses to come in mm. and do, do business. Mm. And if you can do that, then our own in-house uh, manufacturing, because all of those companies will come in and they won't bring everything in they need. If you can get it from down the road, of course, you're going you're gonna to do that. So we would look for, I'd hope that businesses would be able to position themselves if a major uh, manufacturer came in, let's say uh, Boeing came in and planted a, a aeroplane factory somewhere in the UK. We'd look for those businesses around there to maybe think, what, what do these guys need? Is it within our power? Can we do something? Can we come in with a competitive tender or a competitive bid? Or can we do something um, to support that? Because they've put a long-term plant in there that's going to have, you know, you're looking at 25 to 50 year lifetime, lifespan on those things. You mentioned a really good point there, Mark. If you were advising the Chancellor right now, what sectors would you be advising that they should potentially be looking at putting concessions in for? Well, Rushi. Oh, yes. Well, supply chain, obviously. Of course I would. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, ports, fees, charges, things like that. Um, we want to see those as minimal as possible maybe um for those uh, operational workers in ports some sort of concessionary um or some honorarium you know to do with their remuneration their package to bring more people in um a bit like uh, the postal system to bring more people in to deal with pinch point times such as you know christmas cards and such and we said we we need a, a flexible uh a workforce in supply chain we need them to be able to be adaptable and when we look at supply chain talent, uh, the key word there is talent. It's not just, you know, any old person that sits in the shed. This is people that are able to operate um, computer systems, warehouse management systems, things like that. They need, we need to be able to train them and upskill them. So, yeah, I'd look at supply chain wise, that upskilling, flexible workforce, 
a little bit more dynamic than it currently is. Um, other sectors, oh my, where do, where do, where do you start with uh, that? Um, if I was focusing primarily on supply chain, the other sectors is going to be um, ports and maritime. Um, anything that's going to put blockers in the way of supply chain. So border officials, customs officials, that sort of thing, if they end up being required. Um, negotiate, uh, because negotiated agreements, you've always got to give something at governmental level to get something. So if we want our free trade agreement with Europe or whatever, I use that as an example purely, you know, give something up so we get that because uh, free trade is hugely advantageous to the entire country, whether you're, you know, buying aluminium for an aircraft or your, your child's next toy. It's, uh, that's probably where I'd put it. Anything else, I think there'd probably be people screaming at the screen now about manufacturing and, uh, you know, jobs and money on HS2 and things like that. But for me, um, supply chain wise, which is kind of my expertise, that's where I'd, uh, that's where I put my silver bullet. And if you were looking at any other uh, country at the moment and you had to think of concessions that they're providing or an easy country to do business with, um, are there any that you would have your eye on right now? Hmm. Well, there's, there's, there's a favourites. Um, the Middle East, yeah, Dubai, Oman, UAE, always hugely attractive places to do uh, business with particularly in supply chain, particularly in logistics, they're hugely, hugely attractive. They're, um, they have the right mix of uh, business and concession. Uh, we're able to operate there on a very cost-effective basis. And it doesn't mean it's cheap. Um, it's just hugely efficient for us. Um, What's the efficiencies there? Um, everything, everything you need is there, and it's in the right proportions. If I put your mind, say you turn the port of London back into an operational port, we could probably get one you know, medium-sized ship in there a day. Whereas you look at, you know, large ports, Dubai, Sri Lanka, anything around that peninsula, you can get your 130,000 ton super tankers in there with God knows how many containers on. And we can do three or four a day, you know, we can bring it in. And all your infrastructure there, it's got everything. And I'm talking the basics when I talk infrastructure, you know, it's got the power because when a ship pulls in, it, it's got to plug into something, you know, it's, it just can't keep churning those diesel engines on forever. Um, it's the infrastructure for the crew, the road network, rail network, call it what you will, to get that from the ship to its place of origin in a really quick and efficient manner. And quite oftentimes, we will put a ship in one country, let's say uh, Germany, Hamburg, to move it to the UK because that's the most cost efficient way to bring it in. And it's then cheaper to put it on um, road rail into the UK, uh, you know, channel tunnel on, the, on a truck, do it that way, rather than keep a ship for a day at a huge cost. Um, you know, in a port in the UK, you know, do we do multi-port drop-offs for efficiency or do we just do one big hit like you would do in the Middle East? Um, so yeah, Middle East is one, uh, we'd look yep. at, um, one that's emerging, which has always been quite attractive is that's sort of ripe for development in supply chain is South America. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. There are, there are still, um, things that need to be ironed out to make that, you know, truly viable, but yep. South America would be, you know, another really advantageous place um look bearing in mind the countries that it's uh, that it houses and it neighbors you know that could be a, a more efficient cost effective place if um other mainline routes became either unviable financially or it became uh, unusable for us interesting fascinating and um just to talk about india again what's your take on india in terms of do you, do you think it will become a superpower well, superpower, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite an old lexicon, isn't it? When yeah. we think of superpowers, we think Cold War, what was the USSR and the United States, don't we? Um, economically, I think India's already there. It's, it's got the, it seems to have the will and desire and it's got the political makeup to make this, make them uh, you know, a global player. They're already pretty much there. They just need a sort of a little helping hand with, the final touches uh, when we look at supply chain in India in getting in the ethics side, getting out to the consumer side, uh, making more options available. Um, they're pretty much confined to sea and air via 
viability wise for where we're going with that. But what it could be, it could be, um, we you know we may look at Sri Lanka, for example, as the um, putting a hub there. So you could use that as a stop off. So rather than go all the way into India, you can drop off, offload what you need to there. That can then move by smaller sea freight into the Indian subcontinent. But I don't think they need to do an awful lot. If they mirror what they've done in their defence procurement with their everyday procurement, which I believe is pretty much there as well, um, I think they've got a, a kind of winning recipe there. Uh, yeah. the, the mix of make, buy or buy and make seems to work really well. Um, and it's not a model that could be rolled out in any country. It just works particularly well for that demographic, that country, the way that uh, that country liked to work. And the, they reap the benefits of having, even though they've bought off the shelf, they're now making or bolting it together in their own country. Do you think they could be cutting off the rest of the world a bit like China by um, producing it all in-house? No, and I don't think um, strategically they'd want to cut themselves off. Not at all, because there's a certain amount of making it's one thing making the next thing is completely different you know being able to foresee you know if we talk about you know, 1920s post fordism you can have any color you want as long as it's black everyone would say that doesn't work think back to iphones when they first came out they were only black weren't they so if you're the market leader you can do that well india aren't quite there when we're looking at manufacturing market leader so they need to look at the next best thing if they go completely secular and everything goes in-house they're not going to have the ability to be flexible in their procurement and supply chain and buy off the shelf so would you spend millions and millions developing the resource if there's you know nasa for example spent millions of pounds developing the biro pen that will write in space underwater russia used a pencil if you look at procurement you go actually we can get a lifetime supply of pencils for the cost of one pen here yeah, okay, buy a box and then we'll get the license to make it in-house and we'll make pencils ourselves. That, that's the way I think they'll get, they're the, they should go. I can't see them going completely secular because, again, the bare natural resource for a lot of the heavily technical products um, they're going to have to bring in anyway. China's just, um, due to its overall mass, China has a huge amount of mineral resource and rare earth minerals as well. So they don't have to bring as much in. And... Um, you know, it can be completely advantageous for outside companies such as Apple to do their manufacture there because they can bring it in at cost, profit margin, shareholders, etc. Yeah. Do you think we'll see a major contraction with people using China moving forward? I can't see it, to be honest. I, I not, not in supply chain. Um, politically, it may be unpalatable to use one country over another. I think the consumer will ultimately vote with um, ethics, is quite a primary one probably over cost now for most ethics is there if it's ethical if it's priced right and they can get it in a certain amount of time i think um they're not going to be overly concerned if you look in the average uk home you know we've had made in china stamped on the back of our electronic goods now for decades and decades haven't we um it's sometimes the best thing to do is have somebody make a, a little piece of something technologically wise outside your country, bring it in and bolt it together here. So um, I don't think people will, consumer-wise, won't veer away. Supply chain, certainly not. Um, but there may be uh, a security reason that comes up. Why not? We know the Americans are hugely focused on security. And the security implications, you know, TikTok and uh, 5G, Huawei, things like that. Yeah. So that may be something we need to be mindful of. Um, but usually it's the client and the cons it's the client and the customer. So yes. if somebody, if the UK bought, bought Huawei 5G and they were selling it, we in supply chain, we just do the middle part there. So we wouldn't have an awful lot to do. So it, it's basically down to consumer pressure there. But as long as people want things like um, an iPhone or basic electronic goods, uh, they're going to be on the global stage. Conscious of time, I'd like to ask you one more question about carbon footprint and supply chain. One might argue, do the two go together? Um, what's your take on uh, the whole, you know, eco-friendly and supply chain? I suppose the largest thing, I, carbon footprint, you know, I'm not going to sit here and uh, 
try and justify supply chain carbon footprint, everybody knows that ships create a lot of exhaust fumes, carbon, etc. cetera. Uh, the carbon footprint for tankers is huge. Carbon foot, footprint for aircraft are huge. Vehicles, just as bad. So, but one thing that has come in supply chain the past sort of decade or two, which is now hugely uh, beneficial, I think, when we look at the environmental aspects, is what we call re the reverse supply chain. So the supply chain takes uh, material and resource in there, but then we take all of the broken stuff back to be upcycled, recycled, uh, revamped, stripped of its spare asset materials. It just doesn't go into landfill. Now, some of those EU regulations that you cited earlier, you know, which are barriers to production and things like that, the, that old EU little moniker that you got on the back of your electronic goods is, you know, a legal dictate mandate that says how we can dispose of that as a consumer. You can't just chuck it in the bin. And there's a supply chain that takes all of that stuff back. And it's there then to be recycled as, uh, you know, a, a not insignificant amount of precious metals in the average smartphone. Um, and a lot of it can be, we're not just talking about recycling a phone, you know, getting it, cleaning it up a bit and re pushing a handset on. We talk about taking it back to its component parts. You know, can the screens be uh, recycled? And also when we're looking at larger automotive manufacturing, oils, lubricants, things like that, is that are there places that primarily deal in taking away used, let's say engine oil, for example. Uh, aircraft use a whole ream of hydraulic oils, engine oils and things like that, which can be carcinogenic after use. So it's not the sort of thing you want lying around. Is there somewhere that's going to be able to process this and make it back into a more usable form? Uh, you know, turn it back into engine oil, for example, you know, take all the bad bits out. So in supply chain, we'd look at that because an awful lot of what we do now, environmentally, we have to have a reverse supply chain mm. to take it back. We don't just take it there and want it, dump it. And once it's there, it's there. Uh, nor do we um, look to, you know, just palm it off on countries that are willing to take our rubbish to put in their own landfill because you're effectively taking one problem and just shifting it a little bit, which is uh, it's not worth the supply chain to do that. It's not worth the diesel in the ships to mm. take rubbish from point A to stop it getting put in the ground there to take it to point B and put it in the ground. For us, that'd be you know a complete non-starter because you're achieving absolutely nothing. You're just giving the problem to somebody else. So we'd look for uh, the most efficient way in China until recently, because they don't produce much plastic. We're buying an awful, we're bringing in an awful lot of the world's waste, an awful lot of the world's plastic was going there for them to recycle the bits that they could recycle and make their own plastic you see uh, it, it's certain there are advantages and disadvantages so environmentally yeah there's a concern there's bits in the press about um you know carbon neutral aircraft and what we're looking at when we talk about carbon neutral in supply chain they're always going to produce tons of carbon to run and tons of carbon to make so carbon footprint they're a bit of a, a horror story really for an environmentalist so what they actually are talking about are offsetting you know, by doing something else. And a lot of these com uh, companies, you know, they'll, they'll have a huge carbon footprint and they'll, they'll buy some from somebody that's not using a lot. So they'll offset their carbon or they'll go and plant some trees or do something, you know, quite small to offset that carbon footprint. So I think well, there's a way to go environmentally in supply chain. I'm not sure uh, that anything can be done at the moment as long as there's that demand well we've got on this we can come up with a new sort of cleaner power source uh, a renewable energy running ship or something like that um, bear in mind you know nuclear powered ships have been going since the 60s 70s you know things like that um, I'm not saying that's any better for the environment but uh, I'd say the onus there is is there any country out there that's looking into this that shipping companies could purchase off the shelf? Say, look, we want to be as carbon neutral as possible. Um, what, what's out there? Is there anything here? Is there a solar powered engine being made? Is there, you know, something along those lines? I could talk to you for hours, Mark, um, about so many different angles of the conversation that we're having at the moment, but I'm conscious of time. Mark, if anyone has a question for you um, or would like to connect with you, what's the best way forward? Uh, probably, Kay, if I uh, leave you my contact email, 
Yeah. And then you can put that out when you, you post this and they could contact directly. Fabulous. I will make sure I will attach Mark's contact details in the link below so you can reach out to him. Um, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please like, share and um, subscribe. And if you do have any questions, get in contact. And I will see you on our next video. Thank you.